Hi, I'm Shane. This is Vicky. Um, we work at the New York Times, and last year we helped organize the largest union of tech workers in the country. Um, Vicky and I are both software engineers at the Times. Um, I'm also a shop steward with our new unit, and Vicky is the secretary on our unit council. Um, so there's an old saying in organizing, there are no shortcuts in organizing, and it's true. We had literally thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations over two and a half years before we had enough support to go public with our campaign. But just because there are no shortcuts doesn't mean that there aren't speed boosts. So this is the story of how we built solidar solidarity and support for a union with our coworkers told through the technology that we built along the way to help us out. So we built a few things. I'm gonna give a really high level overview of them now and we're gonna talk about them all in depth one at a time. Uh, the first thing we built was a bubble chart generator which allowed us to pinpoint with surgical precision where what parts of the organization we had and hadn't spoken to. We built a website that allowed us to communicate to the world and to our unit while we were going public. We built a Slack avatar generator because I mean, come on. Uh, it allowed us to show support and solidarity in a remote-only workplace. Um, and we built a live vote count tracker that allowed us to have what was maybe the first ever fully public union vote count and build excitement and engagement with our, within our unit and with our greater community in engineering. I did it. I turned on the mic. Okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to forget. All right. So. You work at a company where things are not going quite how you'd like. Maybe there's something really big going wrong. Maybe you're working long hours, you never get to see your partner or your friends. Maybe you're being forced to return to the office after multiple years of successful remote work. And maybe it's a pizza party where your raise should be. <laughs> maybe it's just a series of frustrating working conditions that are causing low retention at your job. It's nothing huge on its own, but things add up over time. Here's the rub though, you love your job. You're good at what you do, and you care about your coworkers. So you can't just quit. You want to make the company a better place to work for you and for everybody you work with. But what are your options? Hey, your friend says, can we talk? And you get pulled into a conference room or a phone call or a secret Zoom meeting, and your friend starts describing all of the same things you've already noticed. There are a lot of decisions being made for you at work, decisions that impact your lives that you have no input into. You either have to negotiate with your manager yourself to get something changed just for you, like permission to work from home, or you have to put up with these policies. It would be really cool if there was some way to work together with your coworkers to collectively discuss what would be best for people and then put those policies into place instead, right? So you know that you want to work together with your coworkers to make the company a better place to be. There's a few different ways to do that, legally speaking. But the most important thing is that you have to get everybody on board, working together. You need to get the largest number of people possible collaborating to build really strong solidarity. So your goal is to map out union support across the entire organization. So how can we quantify that support? Well, there's a pretty standard way to do this um, across organizing uni uh, unions. So we have a five-point system. First of all, you're all in, super pro-union, you want to talk to people. You want to be the one pulling them into conference rooms and discussing. Two, pro-union, don't really want to get involved. So updates, yes, want to know everything that's going on. Three, they're on the fence, they want to know more. Uh, you know, in tech, we don't have a whole lot of education about unions, it's, it hasn't really impacted our lives up until now. There's a lot of details you need to know, any, any number, you need to know more details. <laughs> Or they don't think so. They, you know, need to learn more, but they're thinking of going anti-union. And five, no, they're good. They don't, they don't need this. Um, P.S. Don't get caught. So I want to be really clear. Forming a union is not illegal. If you're allowed to talk about, like, the barbecue you had over the weekend or your cat or something at the workplace, you can talk about your working conditions. It's in fact a protected right under the National Labor Relations Act. But it's really strategic to get like all your ducks in a row before management finds out. That way you can be really strategic about the issues that people care about after you've had more conversations. 
and you can have a really strong base of support before management has a chance to start talking about things that maybe aren't so good in their opinion and spinning the story the other way. So it's time to phone a friend. Uh, what would it look like if you talked to everyone you worked closely with and thought you could trust to keep the secret? So here's your team. You know that you're pro-union. Woo! You know everybody on your team. You can probably assess how they feel about it. You know Alice and Bob, going to be pro-union. They also have concerns. They're going to be on the same page. Eve is really good friends with the manager. Maybe not going to go the way you want. But if you zoom out a little bit, you know that there are more teams. You probably work closely with a couple of other teams. You work closely with a couple of people across the organization. So you have a good idea who you can start talking to, who you feel comfortable discussing this sort of thing with. But as you get further away from your team, maybe not so much. Uh, it's a lot harder to be sure how they're going to respond, especially if you just sort of like pass each other. Um, the other fun thing is that if I work on the same team as Alice, most of the people that I work closely with, Alice also works closely with. So there's a lot of overlap. So you can really get stuck if you're just talking to people based on like mutual connections. And then, of course, when you zoom even further out, there's a lot of levels of management, and the tree gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So even with that rippling outward effect, you're going to run into roadblocks where people just don't have that connection. There are parts of your group that might be deliberately siloed off for practical or political reasons, and that makes cross-collaboration harder. The first step is collecting all of the information about who works where. So nowadays, we have a really handy online directory. And there are some pretty strict policies in our workplace about appropriate use of work resources. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't want to spill the beans too soon, so we didn't want to scrape the site. It was really frustrating. So it was a slow process to pull in the names of all of our coworkers regularly, tracking the new hires and departures and keeping our lists up to date. We sort of did like a quilting bee situation where people joined up in a Zoom call and tried to make light work of it. Um, to be fair, though, we had it easy. In less digital times, I heard of folks working retail having to grab printouts of shift schedules from out of trash bins to collect this. So it was all right. Uh, so this org chart that you have to build up first is really, really important. In the Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, one of the big issues that the workers faced was that they just had no idea how many people would be grouped into that prospective union. They showed up for a card count, which is a union verification step that you need to have the proven support of more than 30% of the group in order to prompt the election. And they expected the total group size to be about 1,500 workers. Amazon responded that there were actually 5,800 workers at the warehouse. This large difference in total workers quadrupled the number of supported card signers that were needed to trigger that election process. So a spreadsheet is where all organizers start. You have to dump your data somewhere. But we had 600 plus people that we were keeping track of, and this got really untenable really quickly. We wanted to track a bunch of fields for each name. You know, We wanted to track the last time they were contacted, what their one to five assessment was, if they had participated in previous actions. Uh, and however many filters or conditional formatting in the world couldn't distill it down to something that was really usable at a glance. So we tried out D3 next. It wasn't the best, but it was functional. Uh, and better yet, I didn't have to code any visualizations. Uh, I'm a back-end dev. That was not going to be great. So I wrote some quick Python processors to crunch the spreadsheet into usable forms and generated files that D3 could use with the hierarchies and colors specified. To be honest, I stole code for this really simple force-repelling graph thing from the internet. And I just kind of let it go, and it was great. Um, the colors are hopefully pretty obvious, um, not color plane friendly, unfortunately. The greener being more pro-union, the redder being more anti-union. And we use gray to label both unassessed and threes, kind of uncertain in the middle. And at that point, you can maybe start to predict some of the issues we were seeing with our color schemes. Uh, but from this, we were able to see some patterns including which parts of the organization we didn't have data on or didn't have support in yet. And this was really invaluable in helping us decide who to talk to going forward. The thing is, like I said, our spreadsheet was getting more and more complex. It wasn't just what number, but we wanted to track more things. 
So um, I added more colors, and this was bad. It was really bad. Nobody could read it. First of all, you can't easily print from D3. There might be a way I could not figure it out. Um, so folks either had to run this on their own computers, which is not an option for our non-engineering brethren in product engineering or product management or um, designers who, who were not going to get this up and running. And it was just honestly really annoying for engineers who don't use Python or JavaScript because they had to install things and get it all working. And it was not good. So I tried taking screenshots. But you have to zoom way in on this sort of a picture because you can imagine each node is a name. So they're really itty bitty. So people were like sorting through terrible screenshots. It was awesome. <laughs> so basically, I asked one of our coworkers, Shay, to try to figure out how to print, export this image somehow. Uh, and instead of doing that, she completely reorganized how we were visualizing things, and it was really good. Um, so, extremely crediting our coworker, Shay Culpepper, uh, she realized that we don't really need any information about the managers. So she was able to remove all of their nodes. And as a result, all the branches that were taking up so much space in the diagram were also removed, making it way more readable. Uh, so instead, each nested bubble is a layer of management. So at the very outside, you have the CTO going inward to your frontline manager. Her tool also allowed us to really easily change color based on the different parameters we wanted to look at. So instead of just the one to five assessments, we could also see who doesn't have an organizing contact or how long ago were they last contacted. Uh, Shay actually spent a lot of time making a shiny interface for this as part of her master's thesis. And now there's a super slick online interface for uploading CSVs and stylizing a whole bunch of different facets in the display. Um, but that came much later and I'll have a link to that at the end. So let's get back to the timeline at hand. Cool. Um, all right. So now we've had all of these conversations. We've built up a ton of support within our unit. And it's time to go public. Um, so what is going public? Unionizing is like a political action. Some of the leverage that unions have come from support from outside of the company. A campaign has a lot more power if, for example, a reader of the New York Times is supportive of the position of the unit in addition to the, the members of the unit themselves. Sorry, skipped a, skipped a button. Uh, this is also the first chance for management to publicly respond to the, the organization campaign. Management doesn't really have anything to address until there's a public campaign. And once we went public, we knew that management would likely almost immediately begin some form of counter campaign. You also have a lot of folks, in our case, a lot, a lot of folks, willing to say that they were willing to support the union behind closed doors. But there's no real way to learn how well that will translate to public support until you actually go public. So this was the first real test of strength for our organizing campaign. OK, so we want to build a website as one of the ways that we're going to provide information for the world and for our unit. So what does that website need? The first two jobs are jobs that pretty much every website has. We had to make it clear the tone and personality of the website owners, which was us. And we had to provide information in a structured and accessible way. We also needed to be able to change the content somewhat rapidly. Things evolve really quickly when a campaign is launched, and we needed to be able to keep everyone up to date. So we based our technology choices on requirements that we derived from those goals. The first two requirements are centered around being essentially accessible for developers and non-developers. People are busy. Union work is basically a second unpaid job. We can't rely on the availability of long-term contributors, so it has to be easy to onboard new developers, and it has to be easy for folks making change to be able to make changes when there are no developers around at all. Also, websites are no good to anyone if they're not accessible to everyone in your audience, so we had to make this reliable and fast for people who wanted to be able to actually access the website. Here's how we landed. To solve for approachable for developers, we picked Next.js. All of our or most of our front-end developers almost exclusively work in React at the New York Times, so everyone was familiar with it. And a bunch of our systems internally and some of the external ones are powered with Next.js. It's also pretty batteries included for a React framework. If you know React, it's not very hard to pick up Next.js. It doesn't have a very big learning curve. 
We picked Netlify CMS as our backend. It's had a really nice balance of being uh, very easy to set up on the developer side. It supported static site builds, which goes into the reliable and fast requirement. And it was very accessible for non-developers that wanted to work on site content. It just has like a nice, very easy to use interface. And a lot of these like pre-built CMS admins don't. Um, we could rapidly prototype and build custom components for the CMS that supported even pretty complex UIs, like a frequently asked question accordion with nested markdown contents. And all we needed to build was like a regex and a React component. And finally, we used Next.js static import, export and Netlify CDN to make the website globally available and fast. So Next.js has this static export feature that builds out a fully static version of the site. So we didn't need a backend application server. That's great. Because then we can throw it on a content delivery network like Netlify, and it's just a static file hosting that can be served at the edge to everyone at some network edge close to them. Netlify CMS also has built-in support for Netlify's identity service for user authentication. Um, and that was great. So Netlify CDN was a natural choice for static file hosting for us. The first. One of the first really test cases for whether our uh, design choices fulfilled these requirements was to add a huge list of testimonials from everyone on the organizing committee on why we were supportive, supportive of the unit. Give us a B plus. This went okay. Um, an engineer other than myself was able to contribute a pretty significant amount of code, and it was really easy to import all the testimonials that we got as markdown files. But I still had to be personally really heavily involved in the development. And we encountered a previously unforeseen issue. Uh, this highlighted testimonials widget that you can barely faintly see, sorry about that, behind the B plus, um, was a really fun new challenge in Jamstack land. Um, this is the kind of thing that would be easy to do if you had a database to grab like three things from. But we had to build everything out to static files in advance. We hadn't really thought about how this would work. So we did a little bit more work, especially around that use case. And then we had another test case to go to. This time, we were building out a frequently asked questions accordion. I think we did way better. The first pass at this was implemented entirely by someone who was totally new to working on the website. And we added this full rich markdown support via myself and another new engineer in a pairing session. And the actual contents of the FAQs were edited by several other people across the unit, many of whom weren't even engineers. Um, so this was getting a lot closer to the actual goal. Finally, the big one was copy editing, editing all of the content on the website. What was great about this is that it was mostly done by somebody who had not touched any of the code up until this point and didn't have to touch any code in order to copy edit the entire website from the content management system. Um, this is what we were going after. This was really exciting. Um, here's a little screenshot of what the website looks like. There will be links at the end, too. OK, next phase. We launch our website and our public campaign. Woo! So we moved on to a new phase of organizing, which is demonstrating public support. The first thing that happens when a unit goes public is we ask management to recognize us as a union. Throughout the campaign, we've been gathering like hundreds of signed cards from coworkers who are supportive of the unit. And it's usually in everyone's best interest for management to just sort of say yes at this point and let us move on to the next phase. But they'll only do it if it feels like a vote would be redundant anyway. So it's not enough for us to know that we have a supermajority of support. We also need to look like we have a supermajority of support. We need to do some sort of performance here for management. Um, the problem here is that this was 2020, so no one was in the office. <laughs> 2021, so no one was in the office. Everyone was fully remote. The only way we really saw each other was in Slack or on Google Meet. So we needed a way to show support on those platforms. Here's what we started with. Somebody had a thought to build some frames around Slack avatars that people could throw on top of their Slack avatars so you would see a little red frame with the word guild on everyone's Slack avatar. So we started out with just like a designer building out a prototype in Google Slides. Each slide was one of these templates, and you could add a photo and then export the slide as a new picture. And then everyone could have these nice guild frame around their Slack avatars. Slack avatars are really visible when everyone's remote. 
but like even for very technical users, this was just a lot of steps to follow. Like getting 600 people to all go through this process basically just wasn't going to happen. And then Olav had an idea. Uh, and then another engineer, uh, basically on a whim, decided to make a super rough tool, uh, just like a web app to make this process easier. Um, it's, not a, I, it's not a new idea. People used to make these all the time in early social media days, especially like MySpace and early Facebook. This was like a really common kind of tool. Um, and he cut out as much complexity as he possibly could. There was no server, there was no database, everything was static files, it was free hosting, it was just one static file. It was just a really simple web page that let you upload a photo and then download a new one that had added this frame. This was a really fun idea. Like people were excited enough about this that when Olav posted a link to it, like three other people immediately jumped in and offered to help. Um, we had another engineer and a designer who were excited enough about the idea to hop in and help out. The designer had the idea to support previewing live the photos and allowing you to immediately try a bunch of different photos so you could see what they would all look like. Uh, and then the other engineer actually implemented the new designs and so we had this sort of swarming effect happen very naturally, uh, just because the idea was very fun and exciting. Uh, and then we got this. Um, <laughs> after we launched this site uh, and pointed people to it, it was really common to have moments like this where uh, in any given Slack channel, almost everyone participating had these fun guild Slack avatars. And it felt really, really empowering. Um, for several months, Like almost every conversation on Slack was dominated by these little red frames. They didn't end up being enough for management to voluntarily recognize us, but it did help us accomplish another goal, which was that everyone could see how many of their colleagues were on their side and wanted to support them, and it was a huge morale boost for everybody to see this. All right, so as Shane said, management was not convinced. They did not just say yes, which was disappointing, but it happens. Uh, so we ended up having to have a vote with the National Labor Relations Board at the start of 2022. Uh, we were voting to say yes union or no union. The build up to this point made really heavy use of the bubble chart, but once the ballots had been mailed back, there was very little to do except sit around and be anxious. Um, psych, <laughs> no NYT election would be complete without an elections tracker. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, we did not implement a needle. So building this tracker was also fast and fun, uh, but it was working towards our goal of building community. It wasn't just building community for our tech unit, but also excitement amongst our soon to be fellow News Guild members, the labor community, and the tech community who was watching onto this. Um, we couldn't let all of everybody into the Zoom call where the board agent read the envelopes one at a time, but we could put up a live feed of the votes as they came in. So roughly two weeks before the vote count, I woke up one day and said, we need a vote tracker. Uh, like I said, I'm a back-end dev. I don't know how to put the pieces together to do this, but I work with amazing folks who are equally excited about the idea. Um, and then we did it. So we had the website already set up, of course, so we were just putting up one additional page. Uh, and as you saw, Shane jumped in to save me, and we recruited a handful of other people to get the, the details worked out. Uh, Jeff, another engineer, and Riley, a designer who worked on a lot of the other projects you saw, uh, jumped in right away. It was literally an hour to hook up the main components and then a bit more time to prettify it. Uh, so this feature introduced a novel requirement, persistence. We needed the website to update live for everyone at the exact same time, so we needed a backend server. Uh, Real-time DB is one of the database options for Firebase, Google's backend as a service offering. Um, we use it for tracking real-time user cursors in the New York Times content management system. It's super easy to set up, so it was a really great choice for this project. So the day of the vote count, this board agent had a stack of hundreds of envelopes and read them out one by one, holding them up to the camera to show them off. Yes. Yes. No. And so <laughs> the, the vote count was a little bit long. And honestly, it's a little complicated because both we and management have the option to contest ballots, but at the end of the day, we needed 50% plus one of the votes of the total submitted ballots. Uh, and you can see very, very faintly on the back our vote count page with the empty tracker at the beginning. So uh, you heard it here first. We manually incremented the vote counts as they were read off. 
we didn't have time to write a wrapper to increment and decrement the votes. So it was harder than it should have been. I manually typed in new values every time we heard a result, delete, 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 enter, enter, enter. Um, and I did make a typo once that said that we won by like three times as many votes as we have members, so whoops. <laughs> um, so did I cry when we won? Yes, I cried. Everybody was crying. It was very exciting. <laughs> Did that crying make it super hard to keep typing numbers into the small box? Yes, also very much so. <laughs> but the confetti was really worth it, even if we had just seen it 15 minutes prior when I made the typo. <laughs> uh, our coworker Joe put this together, and you can still activate it on our vote count page if you go click on the little ta-da emoji. Um, and of course, having a union was also worth it. We immediately started to switch gears and begin the more difficult work of building up our union's democratic processes and gearing up for our first contract campaign. So our organizing efforts were built on many dozens of people having a total of many thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations with our coworkers. Uh, there's no real way to build connections, to build solidarity, community, without getting to know each other. You need to know what people want to improve. And you need to know why. What is it about each issue that makes it so important to them personally? Uh, there was no bit of technology that we built or used during those years or today when we've had a little bit more time to think things through that could have replaced those conversations. Uh, like organizers have been saying for decades, there are no shortcuts in organizing. You have to have those conversations and you have to build the relationships. And that's it. Um, you can see our Twitter, our website, and the amazing bubble chart generator. Thank you. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was about um, how, how does, if at all, the, the way we think about whether people are or will be supportive of the unit shift when we move from the phase of sort of like secretly organizing without going public and to into the phase where we go public? Um, it's a really interesting question. There, I, there are sort of three phases of, of a campaign. So there's this very early like stage zero where you're trying to build out an organizing committee. The organizing committee, the sort of target metric there is to have a representative 10% of your eventual unit size in this organizing committee. And the goal of the organizing committee is to then have all of the one-on-one -on -one conversations with everyone in the unit before you go public. Um, that phase, you want to be as cautious as possible about who you're talking to, and that's when you might have the thought like, oh, this person's really good friends with their manager, maybe I just won't ask them. Um, even then, I mean, we certainly had plenty of folks that were uh, on the organizing committee that were very friendly with their managers. There's no real, there's no real reason to exclude folks just for that reason. Um, but we had to be really thoughtful about who we trusted there. Um, there is, of course, a phase right after that, before you go public, where you want to talk to everyone. And so there is a moment where you just sort of decide, all right, I think we feel confident enough to start talking to everyone regardless of how well we sort of trust them. But obviously we're going to try to keep track of folks who say things like, I'm going to go tell my manager now that you told me this. Um, <laughs> that didn't really happen with us, luckily, but it totally could. Um, and so, uh, and, then, and then there's the public phase, which is what we're in right now, where we have this network of shop stewards that are hopefully speaking to like everyone in the unit every other week, right? So we have like this constant dialogue back and forth where we're trying to make sure that everyone feels connected to the decisions that the unit's making, to our bargaining sessions, to our elections, and that kind of stuff. And so it really does shift, I think, pretty rapidly once you get out of the organizing community phase but there's a weird disproportionate time thing that happens where like the building the organizing committee took us like two years and then it was one year to public after that and six months to vote. Um, so, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good question. So just asking about how, like whether managers sort of found out while we were in the phase zero or whether there were any that were sort of involved or supportive. Um, so, there were, a thing that did happen a few times is, again, this was a two-year process, so there were lots of people who became managers while, <laughs> while they were on the organizing committee. Um, 
they had to leave the organizing committee. So you, so actually, per NLRB law, you can't have any supervisory roles in the same unit as the people that they supervise. So if middle management wanted to make their own unit with only folks that were at you know a certain level of management, they could do that. But they can't be in the same unit as us because they have supervisory roles over us, and it really screws with the democratic power of a union. Um, so we did have a couple of folks that were on the organizing committee, and then were like. <sighs> I gotta go, um, uh, which stunk. Um, and actually part of the reason it took so long was because there was a combination of that and also people who were on the organizing committee were also the people who were who tended to be like the most vulnerable, vulnerable and suffering the most from the lack of union. Uh, and so they would leave the company eventually, um, which stunk. And then we would have to find more people to replace them. Um, so, which is part of why that process took so long. Um, Management like really can't give explicit uh, ex support or detraction from the unit. Um, there's a whole, a whole lot of like legal weirdness around all of that. So there are managers that we know are supportive, but have never said so and can't say so. Um, and we try not to rely on that too much because it puts them in a really uncomfortable position. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So they're asking about like what kind of tools we use to collaborate on code. Um, so we did have some um, GitHub repos. You can make private ones. Now, actually, I think like after Microsoft bought GitHub, I think you can even make unlimited private repos on personal accounts now. That coincided really nicely with when we were starting our organizing. Um, so we did make use of that. Um, we initially just had some folks putting stuff in like private um, uh, like in their personal GitHub accounts. Actually, once we went public with the website, we made a GitHub org for our local News Guild of New York. And so um, all of the stuff that we talked about here is in now, now it's open source in, in the News Guild New York um, uh, GitHub org. And you should totally check it out and let us know what you think about it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, collaborating is also a weird thing to do in private. Um, and we used to like, we used like a free Slack instance with lots of limitations, <laughs> losing messages constantly. Um, yeah, there are some challenges for sure. Yeah. What advice would you give to pro union supervisors? Oh, that's a good question. The question was, what advice would we give to pro union supervisors? I got this one. Okay, good. Okay, so. Generally what happens with frontline managers who we know tend to be really close with their team, they work with them every day, um, they get instructions from on high. Like, our company does not support unions. Our company thinks that it's terrible that unions would get in the way of me and you doing things. Uh, so <laughs> managers have less supervision when it comes to relaying said message to their workers. You know, if they're being instructed to bring everybody into a small meeting and tell them the good news about how terrible unions are, they can be more or less persuasive. Um, so I would say not pushing back maybe as hard as you could would be a really good step. Um, additionally, having group meetings rather than one-on-ones takes a lot of the pressure off of workers uh, so that they don't feel intimidated. Totally, that's a great question. So the, the question is about, it, it feels really challenging to have do a lot of these one-on-one -on -one organizing conversations remotely. Um, you can use video chats, you can use phone calls, but it's just often harder than talking to somebody at lunch. Um, I will say that when I got pulled onto the organizing committee, it was right before the pandemic hit, and the person who spoke to me like brought me out to coffee, and we talked about it, and that was a really nice conversation. It was a really nice way to get onboarded. Um, I can give you the advice to, that I give to all of the stewards that I, that I mentor and all of the organizing committee folks that I mentored, which is uh, DM people, ask for their phone numbers, don't tell them why, and then call them and start talking to them about union stuff. Um, it's, it's weird. Um, I, uh, it, there's no way around it, but no one's ever said no to me. Um, uh, I just like send a message and say, hey, I had something that I wanted to chat with you that, that isn't work related. Do you mind if I ask for your phone number? That is usually enough intrigue for people to be like, I oh, mean, I want to know what you want to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, and then, and then I try to be very straightforward in those conversations. I usually start them something like, 
hey, some folks um, have been talked about talking about being interested in starting a union. How does that sound to you? What do you think about it? And leaving the conversation really open for them to speak as much as they feel comfortable speaking. Um, and I do think that you need to have way more phone call conversations to have the equivalent amount of communication as an in-person conversation. And so just preparing yourself mentally for like, I can't just have one talk with this person. It's gonna be three conversations over a month on the phone instead. Um, but uh, but it'll 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 work. It, like you just got to keep dragging along, um, and and definitely like just starting the conversation is the hardest part for sure. Once you get going, most people are pretty happy to tell you what they think about stuff. I want to add one thing to that, um, especially in the like eleventh hour when we said nobody should be surprised. Everybody needs to hear about this. Uh, we started cold calling like crazy. It was we we had a script and we recruited people. It was like it doesn't matter if you've never done this before here are the things you need to mention. Like, it, it was written out, there were bullet points, whatever you want, start with this. Uh, and since then, we found that that really takes the pressure off of the people reaching out, uh, especially to like random people you've never met before. And so we make these things that we call lesson plans that have sort of different sections about how to start the conversation, questions you can ask, um, what sort of information would be helpful. And they have themes like return to office, yay, nay. Um, and so having a little bit of structure goes a long way towards making other people feel empowered to have those conversations. Well, we have two minutes left, so I'm gonna take one more question, but we'll also be hanging out for quite a while after this and happy to talk more. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we don't share it publicly because they're a little bit strategic. Um, it's the, the same sort of thing where we like, don't really want all of management to see it or management's lawyers or anything like that. Um, especially now that we're bargaining for our contract, we have some things that are like, is this more important or is this more important? And we need to get these things on the table before management does so that we are working off of our things as a baseline. So it's a little bit weird, but we're happy to share them privately. Hit us up. Cool. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you, everybody.